if you are at crisis point Samaritans in the UK you can call them for free they're waiting for your call at Lifeline in the USA that's a free phone number suicide prevention line in crisis feeling bad call this number Hi you're with Scott it's Mental Health Monday it's midnight it's always midnight it's also 8pm GMT which is when Mental Health Monday is this is your right ear and your left ear they all like me to say that where did I want to start with this? I wanted to start with the news here. Mental health crisis ends in cells for too many, snapshot suggests. And this is studies found from 2018, Freedom of Information Act, Theresa May's government, so it's not actually right now bang on, and it was only from seven of the 48 police forces, 43 police forces, sorry, in the UK. So it's only a snapshot, they're saying. It's not a wide-ranging study. But what they were basically saying is the police have to go and sort out mental health issues. They have to take people who are at mental health crisis point, and because they can't take them to a mental health facility, a mental health bed, or a visit from a mental health professional to make an assessment, instead they have to take them to the police station. But there's a basically a bit of law a bit of code that says that's not a safe place for someone who's suffering a mental health crisis to be locked in a police cell so you're not supposed to do that but the police have decided overall in 2018 in this snapshot it has been found you know i've got to be careful about it. i'm not saying this happens to every you know every time but this is what happened in this snapshot they discovered that the police were forced because they haven't got many options to make the judgment call and to say okay we're going to put this person in the cells until we can find a better place for them that was their judgment call so it's happened quite a lot and if that's a reflection on what's happening in the wider society if that's not just a snapshot of these seven police forces if it's happening all over all over the uk probably in america too uh, this is the problem that we're we're dealing with we're looking at today at crisis point is that at crisis point too many people end up in the police cell so what should you do at crisis point we're going to come to that what should you do where to get urgent help for mental health we're going to come to that but before we do, we're going to look at this interesting website, which is how to recognise a mental health crisis and intervene. Well, that's a good idea, isn't it? This is carrierclinic.org. I don't know what carrier... I didn't look into Carrier Clinic and who they are. But on the 31st of May, their psychiatry, psychiatric acute care unit director, Jacqueline Bienenstock, DMP, RNBC hosted a webinar on how to recognize a mental health crisis and intervene. This post provides a breakdown of the information discussed in the webinar. So that's cool, isn't it? That's good. There she is, smiling. The definition of mental health illness in adults. Mental health disorder is a diagnosable illness that affects a person's thinking, emotional state and behavior and the ability to relate to others. Just as diabetes is a dis disorder of the pancreas, I didn't know that, pancreas, mental illness is a disorder of the brain that can make it difficult to cope with the demands of life, disrupting the person's capability to work, carry out activities and engage in satisfying relationships. It's a nice overview, isn't it? One out of five adults experiences mental illness in a given year. We found one in four in the UK figures, didn't we? What is a mental health crisis? A mental health crisis is any situation in which a person's behaviour puts them at risk of hurting themselves or others and or prevents them from being able to care for themselves or function effectively in the community. Many things can lead to a mental health crisis. Home stressors, school stressors, abuse of drugs or alcohol, new medication, stopping medication, treatments not working, all sorts of things. We look at these sort of things on Mental Health Monday every week, don't we? So we know about that. Um, just going to clarify that a mental health crisis is a situation where their behaviour puts them at risk or someone else at risk. So if you're worried that someone's going to hurt themselves or if you're worried someone's going to hurt someone else, that's the point where we're calling it crisis in this setting however i'm going to add in my own bit if you think that someone's mental health has deteriorated below their uh standard not just you know they're feeling a bit down but you think they're not themselves they're going downhill here and you recognize this is a sort of car crash waiting to happen you know, you, you think this is going in a bad way. They're drinking a lot, aren't they? Or they're getting in a few fights. That also, to me, from the outsider perspective, would be nearly a crisis point. They might not be saying, oh, I'm at crisis point. Oh, everything's on fire. But uh, 
you know, we're one step away. I don't think you need to wait till things are on fire. You know, if you can see the matches and the gasoline from the Americans, if you can see the uh, the petrol, you know, all over the floor, then that's quite an emergency in itself, isn't it? So, you know, I'm going to say just one step before that as well counts, in my opinion, as part of the crisis, the lead up to the crisis, the breakdown to the crisis. Breakdown is a good word, isn't it? If someone's breaking down, do you have to wait until they're fully broken before you can step in and say, okay, we're at crisis point now? No, the, the start of the breakdown, the lead up to it, that's all part of the crisis. Anyone that may be going through a mental health crisis may experience guilt, anger, or grief. It's important to address a mental health emergency quickly and effectively. Gosh, I wish the governments would listen to that. Some individuals who are dealing with a mental health illness may not exhibit any warning sign. Please remember, no one's to blame, not the person or the family surrounding the person. That's a good point, although sometimes people are to blame. So, <laughs> no one's to blame, not the person or the family. I get what you're saying. Remember, the person who's at crisis might not be to blame. Remember, the person who is at crisis might be lashing out against people who might not be to blame. But ultimately, remember that also someone might be to blame. Some people might have done some pretty mean things to people to cause them to feel bad. So that's, you know, I'm going to pick them up on that. It says, it says there right under chat where you can't see it, that maybe the person's not to blame. But I think sometimes people, sometimes people might be. Might be not healthy. Might not be healthy for us to be portioning out the blame at this stage. Might not be worth us. It might not be worth us using our energy to allocate blame when there's somebody that needs to be helped. You see what I'm saying? But but yeah, maybe later. <laughs> warning signs of a mental health crisis. It's important to know and recognize the warning signs that an individual may be struggling with so you can support them in the best way possible. According to NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, these are the most common warning signs. Inability to perform daily tasks, bathing, getting dressed, etc. So somebody who's not even in the basic routine, who's not even, uh, you know, they're letting the beard grow. They're letting the hair grow. They're letting the uh, wearing the same clothes all the time, not brushing the teeth. Inability to perform daily tasks, rapid mood swings. Somebody who can get cross or can be defeated by seemingly random events. Increased agitation. Someone who's getting anxious or angry. Risk taking out of control behavior we talked about this as part of self-harm didn't we risk taking and out of control behavior someone who's uh someone who doesn't really seem to care for the consequence of their actions abusive behavior to the self or someone else that's more clear isn't it if someone we don't always recognize it as a mental health crisis but if someone is being abusive that's not a standard, maybe, you know, we talk about this in life, don't we, about good and bad, evil and good people and bad people, but really, we're all people, and we all do things in our life that are, are good, and um, sometimes we do things in life that maybe are bad, and it doesn't mean that we are a this or a that, it means that we're human, and as part of the human experience, we do things, and we make mistakes, or we feel like this, and then change our minds, or whatever, you know, so I'm not here to say, there are bad people out there and you're one of them because you've done something bad and if being abusive makes you a bad person I'm here to say that if you can see someone who's being like that maybe it's a result of a mental health crisis and maybe it's a symptom of a wider problem and something that we need to be more compassionate about and that sounds hard doesn't it because you're going to be compassionate to the people who are being abusive you're going to be compassionate but eventually after you've stopped being angry and you know you've stopped you're taking your step back and you don't see them anymore because you don't want to hear from them. Eventually, uh, you know, they're still sadly angry and alone. And eventually you and your compassionate side comes around and says, you know what, I still want to help them. Because <laughs> eventually you are a good person really, aren't you? You are good really, you see. This is the point really. You are good really. And you kind of want to help the people who are doing these. Because this is society, isn't it? If we could help these people who are being abusive... And we wouldn't have trolls on Twitter. We wouldn't have people beating each other up for their sexual preferences. You know, if we could help these people to feel less, if they're not on a mental health crisis path, if they're not feeling agitated and angry and out of control, maybe they don't do so many of these abusive things. That's interesting. Isolation from school, work, family and friends. This is a tough one too, because if someone's having a mental health crisis, if they're feeling down and depressed, uh, if there's been, certainly if there's been a trigger, Certainly with grief, 
or a relationship breakdown or something like that if there's been a trigger then they might want to say look i just want to spend some time at home now i don't want to come out to do the thing i don't want to come to the birthday party i'm gonna stay away from work you know i need some time off i don't want to go to school those sort of feelings are going to come to the fore and you need that time to recover i totally get that but it can also lead to a deepening mental health crisis because you're shutting yourself off from the things that can improve your mental health the most. So there's that to look out for. And it's hard to look out for because you can't see them doing it because they're not there in your eye line. They're away, aren't they, these people? Uh, that's a bit of a vicious cycle. Loss of touch with reality. Hard to gain a handle on from the outside unless people are actively making statements and doing things that makes you think, hang on, that doesn't make much sense. But if it's you on the inside, it's even harder to get a handle on because if you're losing touch with reality, you only perceive things from your perspective. You think it's real. This is why with people who are having delusions, you don't really say to them, oh, don't be silly. That's ridiculous. You're having a delusion. Sit down and just you know stop being delusional. You have to say to yourself, okay, in their world, this is what's real. So to them, this is real. I'm going to say to them, okay, I don't see this. I don't have the same perception as you. But if that's how you feel, we're going to make you feel more comfortable. You know, I'm going to treat it as real to you because it is real to you. I'm not going to devalue it and say it's uh, just nonsense. So loss of touch with reality is very difficult. But there are ways, I'm going to come on to the seeing, you know, we're going to come on to the help kit in a bit. There are ways to make, yeah, almost a bit like that film Inception where they've got those spinning things that uh, keep you in, you know, whether you're in a dream or not. There are ways to touch base with reality, I feel, and we can look at those in a little bit. Uh, rehabilitation versus punishment. Rehabilitation and compassion seem to work better. Yeah, that's going back to the abusive behaviour, isn't it? Yeah, uh, the, the difficulty, of course, in, and I'll pick this up because it's a really good point that Snips has made here, rehabilitation versus punishment. What we went from a very start point is the difficulty with this is that the abusive behavior usually brings the crime and punishment aspect into the the circle someone who's suffering with a mental health breakdown might end up being arrested might end up being approached by the police through their out of control risk-taking abusive behavior and instead of being able to access any sort of mental health service even though we saw at the start it's the probably one of the least safe places for them to be locked in a police cell uh, they end up in that system and then through that system they become even further criminalized because once you're in an institution with lots of other people and you're having your breakdown and you know acting violently and abusively you're going to end up having fights punishments further incriminations you know it it, it can be a really serious problem uh, and one that could have been solved if we could have maybe looked at the core reasons for someone's behavior rather than simply punishing the uh, the consequences. Final one there, paranoia. Uh, very similar to the loss of reality, but a bit easier to spot with paranoia because it's an accelerated version of reality. You don't normally uh, experience, and even whilst you are paranoid, you can say to yourself, this seems a little bit excessive. <laughs> Even if you fully believe in the delusions, you can also, the reason you feel paranoid is because they're on an excessive edge. They're not normal. So paranoia is an interesting one as well. Yeah. Warning signs of a mental health crisis, paranoia. And that's difficult because the people who are paranoid are least likely to reach out and to interact with uh, agencies of support, I guess. Sometimes it's difficult to refrain from being reactive to painful things a person struggling with mental health may say or do. You probably can't help them a whole load if you're focusing on how they make you feel rather than how they are feeling. That's really true. And I'll, t I'll dig into that a little bit as well. Uh, often the people who are dealing with these things are either close friends or family members. And so the minute that one thing starts to get said by somebody or an attitude starts to come up about this or that, it can de devolve into a more squabbly argument you know it's very hard to sort of say exactly what Snips has said uh, to refrain from being reactive to not to not bite isn't it it's very hard to not bite and quite often the people who are doing the action who are doing the the, 
the um, we'll say aggressive action uh, they actually want a response they want you to bite because it's this playing out of this um, I, I see it a bit like a, a living soap opera you know some people they've watched so much in my opinion I might be wrong about this they've watched so much stuff on telly and in the news and they want their life to be dramatic as well and I'm not this is a bit silly what I'm saying because I'm not labeling every single person who's having a mental health breakdown as a dra dra drama queen absolutely not absolutely not what I'm doing but what I'm saying is that there seems to be this function of argument argument um, it gains attention it creates uh, uh, like this ongoing storyline of who said thing to what and who's right about this and it creates um you know life can be boring can't it but not for the people who are constantly throwing out all this um dysfunction it's not boring for them uh it's crying out for help and pushing us away at the same time says snips they're often confused by their own behavior yeah you see that makes sense and so if you take that away if you take all that away what have they got you know they're left with fewer tools to communicate with they're left with fewer interactions. They're not as important in a way. You know, important's a good word, isn't it? Because someone might want to feel important and not know, uh, not know whether they do or not. Even maybe their own feelings of self worth. But by causing these dysfunctions, suddenly they are the centre of this universe of chaos. So you have to deal with it, sort of thing. So yeah, um, and we're going to come on now to a very tough topic aren't we when the crisis involves the risk of suicide risk of suicide is a major concern for anyone with a mental health condition and those who love them encouraging someone to get help is the first step towards safety people who attempt suicide usually feel overwhelming emotional pain yep been there <laughs> straight away with the jokes i'm not joking um you know we can talk about that another time maybe but yeah been there loneliness worthlessness, hopelessness, powerlessness, frustration, shame, guilt, rage, and sometimes self-hatred. So like these are, imagine that, if you don't feel, <laughs> wait, what am I saying? Wait, what am I saying? If you don't feel suicidal, imagine it, imagine it. <laughs> I can't get really sort of laughing because it's funny the way I, I, I think and behave. Uh, I don't want you to imagine it. I don't want you to feel like that. I don't want that. But this collection of feelings, overwhelming pain, worthlessness, frustration, rage, it it's such a... No, what I'm trying to say is imagine a nice box of chocolates. Imagine your favourite box of chocolates. You know your, your favourite chocolates and there's all the different ones in there, aren't there? And then we've got the colouring, coloured wrappers and there's the ones that you, you like and there's the ones that you don't quite like because they're a bit chewy. And why did they put that one in anyway? Like That one's always left at the end. But, you know, in, in the main, you pick out these three and you put them in the cupboard because you make sure you've got them for later. And then, like, you've got your favourite ones. Imagine your favourite box of chocolates. Now imagine each and every chocolate is just horrible. All your worst foods. You know, it's bits of fish eye and, and all horrible you know, all horrible things oh, all the rubbish all, uh, all the horrible things you don't want to eat each and every one and not only have you got to eat them <laughs> not only have you got to eat them you know forced them down but that's every day isn't it? that's every meal this is the sort of point I'm trying to make is it's pretty bad <laughs> yeah it's pretty bad it, it, it is pretty bad what am I trying to say here I'm trying to emphasize that that collection of emotions is you can see why people look for a route away from that you can see why people look to escape from that and when the options they have to stop that collection of feelings to stop having to eat those horrible chocolates all the time when the options are limited you can see why potentially easier or more accessible options end up in their mind as an option as a as a um as a choice and with suicide of course it's very difficult to go back isn't it it's very difficult to say well you know i tried that and it wasn't really the best thing <laughs> it's very difficult to say the next day i felt completely different you know i, I went out and i 
spent all that money on that jacket and then I don't ever wear it. It's just in the cupboard. You know, the next day I felt a bit different. I bought those shoes off the internet thinking they were just my thing, right up my street. And they've just sat in the box in the cupboard. Never wore them. You know, imagine if you did make a decision like that and it's, you can't go back on it. Can't go back on it. Um, but you can see why people with chronic pain have no escape. People with physical and emotional pain feel it's never going to end. So you can see why it comes up. Social isolation. Social isolation is very common in the lives of those with mental illness because it reinforces the belief that no one cares if they live or die. And that's interesting. It's not, it's just, I'm trying to do this one bullet points, but it's really interesting. Um, we've got a friend who recently uh, we discussed mental health with who was going through a rough patch and I don't know I didn't say to them you know I, I care if you're here or not uh, a different friend we recently bought a gift for and I say we um, my basically someone recently said to me us this is a nice gift not only because it's a nice gift because it sort of says that I'm in the, the group I'm in the crew sort of thing um, and I thought well that's a strange thing to say because I've sort of felt that about you for a long time like you I'm not going to name the, the things that we've done together on the internet because obviously I'm trying to make this general and not specific but um, this I could have listed things about this particular person that um, over the years we've done together and you know if they ever want to pop by the doors open we're in the crew we're friends but uh, we never said it you know no one had ever said to each other look you're definitely my friend now <laughs> Do you know what I mean? No one had said, look, this this third invite to my house is the one that tips you over the edge where you're allowed to text me. In fact, I don't text and call back people all the time. I'm not, not big on that. I either see them a lot or I don't. And it just, we talked about that before. But uh, self-isolation, we're talking about suicide here and the, the crisis point, is that if people believe no one care if they live or die. Well, you don't know because people don't generally tell you. But honestly, they do. They do care. And you'd be surprised You'd be surprised. Here's a different question. Here's a different question to put this in context. Has anyone ever died and you felt really sad about it and yet they've not been that close to you? Maybe it's been someone you knew through work or a colleague or a teacher. I remember when I was a kid, a teacher died and it really upset me, but I don't think they would have known how upset I was because to them, I was just one of the kids in the class. You know, and they didn't teach me. They only taught me, taught me for a little bit. You know, they had so many more people in their life that were close to them, that were upset. They would never have known how upset I was. So to me, it was huge when they passed. But they didn't really know that. Imagine that. Like, you think about that, you know, in terms of crisis point, imagine people that you've known that have passed that it's really been a big effect on you, that you didn't really, you know, you never even told them. You never even sort of... Uh, made a big thing in in life about how important they you didn't even know how important they were to you until they were gone well that could be you <laughs> so don't just jack it in because someone does care if you live or die someone might do anyway Robin Williams passed there's one there's a really good one yeah um, celebrity deaths so, uh, that is a good hello stolen waffles hello stolen waffles you're new <laughs> I'm going to point at you and tell you that you're new to make you feel really included and part of the group <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that you don't feel like you know <laughs> don't feel embarrassed at all hello you you're new <laughs> um but uh i don't know if you are new you are new i think in chat uh, well at least your name has not repeatedly come up. there you go it's all good it's all good so there we go it's all good it's fine um it's a good example though of robin williams passing and the celebrity deaths in in general because they're people that we know, aren't they? But we don't know them. We don't spend time in, in their in their lives. But sometimes their absence can feel huge. And we didn't realise what it was they were giving to us, what it was they were, um, how they were enriching our lives until that was removed. And you thought, oh, I can't have any more of that. I'm not going to get any more of that. And so during the time that they were alive, I, I, never even, I never even attempted to go and see Robin Williams live in concert. I never even thought about it. But then after he died, I realised he did such good stand-up because, you know, more of this material came to the fore, didn't it? And I thought, gosh, I've missed the opportunity to see a wonderful comedian live in concert. I should do that more. So 
and, and the sadness as well. Um, maybe Robin Williams didn't fill me with the same level of sadness, but I know exactly what you mean for other celebrities that I didn't realise were going to make me feel... Um, UB40, today, uh, the... Um, uh, the the trump 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 he plays a it's like a big horn <laughs> saxophone the saxophone player of ub40 uh it was announced that he died today and that made me feel really sad because in the same exactly the same oh look thank you for the gifting the sub and thank you for saying thank you an official ganji puka warrior you are now official you've got your subs Description, which hasn't got any little emotes yet because we still haven't got there yet because it's such a lot of hard work for me to make such an important decision but we've got subscribers we're new on the old twitch we're new this year so um you're part of the ganji puka warrior crew now so there you go there's some gifting tier subs going on there's some thankings going on i really appreciate the the concept of gratitude and the thanking that's going on between you so that's important to highlight and we've also importantly highlighted when people die we care they might not be, uh, they might not know how much we care. And that's, I'll tell you what as well, I'll tell you what as well. On top of that, uh, the the celebrities, there's this other point that's like brewing in my mind here. There's this outpouring, isn't there, when they die, of this, like, oh, I loved it so much when they did this. Sean Locke recently died, a British comedian. And I was surprised by the amount of content that's been shared on social media about how many people loved him and loved his work and they didn't share this when he was alive <laughs> you know there's this extra outpouring because maybe people feel like oh sugar i should have said something when he was alive i should have you know maybe we should all take from this a little point a little scotty's top tips scott's top tips maybe we should all make a point of saying something nice about someone we respect to them you know in the public sphere uh because we do care, don't we? And we're learning that, how important it is. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and we could go into the um, Robin Williams. I mean, this We're talking about suicide, aren't we? So maybe we should go into it now. Um, I believe Robin Williams had health concerns as well as, you know, he had problems with alcoholism, problems with substance abuse. He had problems with mental health. I think he had problems with bipolar. And I think he had problems with a degenerative brain disease as well. And, you know, like we were talking about before, overwhelming emotional pain, loneliness, worthlessness. How can someone so loved, so popular and so charismatic feel? Oh, no, sorry, not the Ubi Swords and Saxophonist. Sorry. Now I'm getting my dead people confused. <laughs> I'll say the thing about Robin Williams and then I'll say the other thing. Um, the Robin Williams thing, how can someone so amazing that we see as such a shining light feel so isolated, alone and frustrated, feel so helpless and worthless that they'd just like to jaff it in now? That is something that I still can't quite get my head around because it would seem that all they would have to do is to, you know, to just simply... Um, you know, cast their net a little bit and see what people think. But uh, it is so important to realise that if that can happen to someone like him, then, you know, somebody who's not loved by all, lauded on stage, DVD extras, you know, could just welcoming tonight on stage for their interview. Robin Williams, you know, someone who's not got all that. Um, imagine how easy it is for them to slip, you know, when they stay at home and no one cares because no one cares. Yeah. Well, we care. We care. We care. Yeah. He battled dementia. There you go. And uh, it is a, a battle to, you know, accept a diagnosis. Yeah. And certainly things like that you can feel that you're alone with, can't you? Because it is you that's carrying it. But uh, we, in a way, we're always alone. But in another way, we're not because we're all human and we've all, we can share other people's experiences so we're all part of that that mix any talk of suicide i should do a for this for the edit any talk of suicide must always be taken seriously if someone has attempted suicide before the risk is even greater these are the warning signs okay this look out if you spot any of this if you know anyone who's doing this if you know anyone who's doing this or if you yourself are doing this without really thinking and understanding why this is the you know this is the point where we want to step in and intervene not when it gets too late not when it gets too late so the following are warning signs of suicide giving away personal possessions 
I've got to be able to talk. <laughs> Talking as if saying goodbye. Stockpiling pills or obtaining a weapon. That's a bit of a scary one, isn't it? Stockpiling pills or obtaining a weapon. I'm not going to stop and make jokes. I'm just going to get through them. <laughs> Taking steps to tie up loose ends. Making or changing a will. Preoccupation with death. Sudden cheerfulness or calm after being despondent. That's a bit of a weird one. That's me, isn't it? That's what I'm doing all the time here. Yeah. I'm not being that despondent, but I suppose I will pick out a couple of these. I'd like to pick out preoccupation with death because sometimes uh, teenage angst, being a bit of a goth, the Kurt Cobain effect, sometimes there's a romance involved in suicide that people experiencing dysfunction as teenagers can veer towards and it's why that art form that music that rock music that um i don't know what they might call it these days emo i bet they don't call it that anymore either but uh, it's what that is fueled by and expresses we talked about express yourself last week uh or the week before so there are some aspects of that which are okay to work through but of course, stand out as well as a preoccupation with death that are important to, to focus on and to look into. Um, the cheerfulness could stem from knowing that the end is finally coming. Now they have their plan in order. Wow, that's heavy, isn't it? That's heavy. That's an interesting way to look at that. I was going to say that it might be that they just try and um, hide their, you know, if, if I'm going to show you my true despondency and then realize, oh, sugar, I'm telling people this thing and I want to hide it away then I'm going to pretend it's all alright it's just a facade but I totally agree this thing uh, it could stem from them knowing the end is finally near like you know nothing matters anymore yeah uh, Snippy Snip says they're cheerful because they've got a plan for their suicide and it's a relief from pain so yeah yeah, you, you're both um, more educated than I on this I me 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 more educated than me on this <laughs> increased drug or alcohol use that one makes sense we can see that but it's important to note as well that somebody who's a bit of a party animal or you know is always down the pub might not be just a hedonist might be following this path dramatic changes in personality drop me pencil dramatic changes in personality mood and or behavior saying things like nothing matters anymore you'll be better off without me and life isn't worth living they're pretty clear ones aren't they they're pretty clear Withdrawal from friends, family, and regular activities. Failed romantic relationships. History of suicide attempts or family or friend suicide attempts. So I'm going to pick up another couple of points here. I'm going to pick up another couple of points. The withdrawal from friends and family and the failed relationships is more obvious to somebody in the family who sees that happening to somebody, yeah. The history in the suicide and the friend suicide is a bit more of a, a subtle effect. That, and I've seen it in action in real life as well. So, um, yeah, for some reason, knowing someone close to you who actually goes through with killing themselves, for some reason, it, it elevates that risk. Maybe because you, you know, have to con. Maybe because you have to, uh, what's the word? Con, con, I want to say construct. What I mean is to face it head on, confront. Maybe it's because you confront that concept and are forced to think through it. Maybe it's because of the pain and the anguish that you are overloaded with by the process of having to do that. I don't know. Um, I'm not even going to pretend to know. Uh, but it's important to know that if you do know somebody, I don't want to say this. If you know somebody who knows somebody who's killed themselves, if you, if in your social group somebody has attempted suicide or knows someone, who, you know, you've got to keep out, keep a lookout for each other. That's the way I want to say that. You know who I'm talking to. You know who you are. You because our social group, my local friends group. You know, we know who we are. We've got a friend who is not with us anymore through their own choice. And, you know, we've got to look out for each other. Yeah. We've all got to look out for each other because of that. That's important to know. We got there, didn't we? We got through that little that little one. Whew. 
What to do if you suspect someone is thinking about suicide? If you notice any of the above warning signs, or if you're concerned someone you know is thinking about suicide, you must start the conversation. Mind blown. You must start the conversation. I thought they were going to be like, start the ambulance. You must call the... No, no. Start the conversation. Talk to them. Talk to the people around them. Talk about the things that they're struggling with. Start the conversation. How to talk to someone at risk of suicide. Open the conversation by sharing specific signs you noticed. For example, I noticed lately you've not been sleeping well. You're not interested in basketball anymore, which you used to love. And you're posting a lot of sad songs on Facebook. That's their example. I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> I've noticed that you've been putting salt in your porridge. I've noticed that every time you go past number four, you kick their cat. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making my jokes. Not, no, it, it, come on, put it back in. Put it back in. Put it back in. And that's good, though. So, number one, bullet point one. Say the things that you're concerned about. Give them the examples. Bullet point two. The next question should... Ex yeah. The next question should establish if they're thinking about or planning for suicide. This could be along the lines of, are you thinking about suicide? Do you have a plan? Do you know how you would do it? And what was the last, when was the last time you thought about suicide? If the answer is yes, or if they think they might be at risk of suicide, you must seek help immediately. Good calls. You know, that's, and that seeking help bit is what we're going to come on to in a minute. So bear with me on that but it's not going to be as easy as we hope it would but there are avenues we've looked at the very start lifeline samaritans they're great avenues they're great places to start they're great places to start the doctors 111 national health in the uk 999 if it's a police-based emergency which we hope it doesn't get to uh 111 even if you want to talk to the police and you're not sure so websites of course but you know these are things that I've had to say out loud so make sure we said them but really interesting here that to say to somebody how would you do it that seems like a really awkward question doesn't it seems like a really awkward question and also not one I'd want to have to answer or to ask uh, I wouldn't really if I knew someone was suicidal I wouldn't really want to sort of be uh, talking about the mechanics of suicide I'd want to get them off it distract them but maybe it is important they're saying it's important maybe it is important because i guess then you're more prepared to help prevent it and you're more understanding of how serious they are there's some things to think about if the answer is yes with any of those questions you think they might be at risk you get help immediately you call a healthcare professional you remove things like weapons and medications so i didn't say that but that's good isn't it remove the dangers you can't do the padded room you're not going to wrap everyone up in bubble wrap but, you know, don't just leave the, uh, the bottles of dangerous medicines or, you know, sharp tools around. It makes sense, doesn't it? Call 911, 118. Call that number. Listen, often... <laughs> I read that there as, listen, offer support. But it means, listen. Offer support and assurance. Focus on being understanding, caring, and non-judgmental. For example, you're not alone. I'm here for you. You're important to me. We'll get through this together. I'm concerned about you, and I want you to know that there's help available to help you get through this. That's their suggestion. We talked before in Mental Health Monday about using you at the start of your sentence as a part of an empathy process. So it might be tempting for you to say, look, I'm going to help you. I know that you feel bad. I know a way you can get out of it. I'm here for you. But what this person who's suffering is hearing is, I, I, I. They don't want to know about what you feel. They're suffering. So are you telling them about what you, I today, I like EastEnders. I like chocolate. I feel this. I think that's good and I think that's bad. It's all about you, isn't it? It's I, I, I. Don't let I be your favourite letter of the alphabet. Don't let I be the first letter of your sentences. Start with you. If you use your favourite letter of the alphabet, you say to this person, so you feel really down, so you are having these thoughts, we're guiding them into a place where 
Not only can we show them we understand what they're saying by repeating back to them. Oh, thanks, Nigel. The mic's buzzing sometimes. It's a function of the wires. <laughs> oh, and I've got too many of them to potentially. It didn't do it the other day, did it? Didn't do it the other day. Maybe it's because I'm getting too animated. We'll turn the compressor down a little bit. The gain down. I don't know. <laughs> Can't fix it now. We're way too far in to fix that now. Uh, but thanks for telling me. I will attempt to remedy it. Uh, <laughs> we are saying you at the start of our sentences. And if someone is having a crisis, it's going to show them that you understand where they are coming from. Because you're able to tell them, maybe in the slightly different words from the words they've used. So it helps to show them that you've understood them. And you're giving them the space to then talk more about themselves. You're not judging, like we said at the start, not judgmental. You're not saying you feel this and therefore I think this. You're saying you think this, here is space for, for saying some more. Um, it's good practice to create a space for them to feel like they're being heard and that you value their thoughts. Yeah, that's key, isn't it? And we said this at the start as well, they might be having some really strange thoughts. So saying to them, no, that's a silly thing to think. Oh, you shouldn't think like that. That doesn't really establish this safe space, does it? It sort of says to them that, well, if I say what I think, they shut me down. So maybe it's okay to say, that's surprising to me, <laughs> but go ahead, go on. Uh, you know, Maybe you yourself are gonna need to have a bit of a poker face on some of these things and to be able to not react and to say, okay, fair enough, safe space, go ahead. Really good, we're getting some good points out of that, that's good. What not to say if you suspect someone is thinking about suicide? What not to say? So we've got some good ones out of this, hopefully. Do not. Do not. I, I, I don't know why, but I, I like a do not list so much better than a to-do to -do list. Do not lists are really easy to accomplish, for number one. You just sit still. They're all done. <laughs> and number two, I don't know what it is about it. I don't know. It's just something about it. What you shouldn't do. Here we go. Do not promise secrecy. Instead, you can say something like, I care about you too much to keep this thing a secret. You need help, and I'm making sure that you get it. That's quite bold, isn't it? That's quite bold, quite brave what they've said. I might temper that with saying, look, we'll keep this between us for now, but I believe we should be talking about it with more people. How about we bring in X, Y, Z, you know, so you, you acknowledge their desire for secrecy, because often people are not going to want to shout this from the rooftops. So you acknowledge their desire for secrecy and you respect their, their, what they're asking of you, but you also put forward your case, not in a big way, but just put forward the fact that uh, you do want to talk about it with more people. You probably will do, you know, you're going to, it might come out nicely by saying, uh, I need more help with this from so-and-so. Is it okay if I talk about it with them? You know, can we bring them in? Maybe bringing someone in seems a little less threatening than I'm going to tell everyone. You know what I'm saying? So there's, there's Scotty Hottie's tip for that. Do not debate the value of living or argue that suicide is right or wrong. That's interesting, isn't it? I really don't know why that's there. I don't... Uh, it seems so natural to debate that, but of course the person you're debating it to is not seeing these things. They've already gone through this. They're already down their path. They've already made their choices. So the debate is really, you know, when you're arguing with someone, like we've had so many arguments recently, you know, we've had Brexit in the UK. We've had this coronavirus, people's different opinions about vaccines and all that. It It's not, uh, the vaccine opinion is probably a good, way of explaining this is that if someone said to you i've got a friend who recently i found out he's anti-vax gosh and so if i go to them and say oh well here's all the information about vaccines well they've already been on the internet and looked at all the information haven't they so they're coming to me saying well actually here's all the information about anti-vaccines well we're not coming to it i'm not looking at their stuff and going oh that's interesting i think they could be right and they're not looking at my stuff thinking that in fact we're just trying our hardest to make the other person see our point of view we're not trying our hardest to understand their point of view and to take it on board. So if someone is feeling suicidal and you argue with them and you're arguing with them, they might even start feeling more set in their idea. 
They might defend their position. They might not agree with the things you say. And then where have you got into an argument? And they don't even agree. They just try and push their point. So uh, that, that energy is probably not the right energy for somebody who's suicidal, that argumentative energy. Even if it's about the core issue that they're dealing with, arguing your way through it yeah I mean, this is something i, I said to a, a i once met an irish man on a plane it's a really cool story um a real life irish man and i'm a real life english man of sorts you know i'm multicultural racial or whatever you want to call it uh i get to claim because my dad was born in a different country anyway look what we're going to say is that uh, me the english person the irish but we have cultural differences and there are things that uh he explained to me about things that had happened in the past i didn't even know so uh one of the things i said to him and we didn't have an argument and he was like he was saying this is interesting that we're not having an argument even though our points of view do not correlate and i said yeah because you can't actually get anywhere by arguing with someone like no one ever changed anyone's mind with an argument did they and that sounds bizarre doesn't it because that's the whole point of an argument is to change someone's mind but the way we've set this up the way and this goes back to our culture in the west and it goes back to our um this is really key it goes back to a social social culture a social set of norms and values that was imposed on us by the aristocracy by uh and we're going to sort of marxist places you know the proletariat the working classes and the um the bourgeoisie but the bourgeoisie you know the the public schools the Eton colleges the Oxford universities they've got a system of debating a subject where you have this house believes and you put them on one side and then you have the other team and they believe this other thing and you write your logical arguments you go through your um is it Plato or uh was it Plato who you know logic logical forms aristotle might anyway i'm not a philosopher i'm not on philosophy tube there are some really good philosophers who do some really long interesting videos about this sort of concept but my point is is that we learned to debate topics from one side and the other you see it now in politics don't you and in politics the right wing like imagine if donald trump and um who was he having a row with <laughs> Joe Biden you know imagine if John Trump to Joe Biden did their debate and at the end of the debate one of them said do you know what I agree with you what you said makes sense I didn't I've never heard that before that's interesting I will think about that and maybe change to be on your team like that's not the point of it is it like Donald's not going to say that to Joe Joe's not going to say that to Donald they've heard all the arguments they've researched them and their bit of paper is how to rebut them so arguments don't change opinions not between the people who are arguing they might inform people who are watching on of the potential opinions but quite often the people watching are already invested in it to the point that they've developed their own opinions so going back to the anti-vax you can't say to an anti-vaxxer here is the information uh, why would they believe me over the sources they've already gone into you know my friend when my friend who's an anti-vaxxer is getting his information he's not ringing me up and saying scotty hotty I've got information on the internet. I want to run it by you first because you are the person I trust with information. They're not. They go on their own thoughts process, don't they? I don't call someone up and say, excuse me, I've, I'm trying to develop my opinion. Can you tell me what it is? But yet they find the information, they get it themselves. So they're not, when I start to argue with them, they're not going to say, oh, thank God I've met you again, Scotty Hotty, because I value your opinion over my own and I'll just listen to you and change mine. It, it just, so yeah, I've I made that point. But it's really important here in terms of suicide, isn't it? Do not debate the value of living or argue that suicide is right or wrong because you're not going to convince someone of something through an argument. You're going to create a bad energy. You're trying to work together this is the follow on point from this is we were trying to work together and that's why politics is so excuse my language chuffed <laughs> why chuffing politics is never going to chuffing work it's never going to chuffing work because it's designed to create this irreparable difference when really we should be saying okay these are all our opinions but instead of voting for this one and you're in charge and you're only a third of the party and you'll get your little seat instead of that we're all forced to work together because in society we are. We can't say, oh, well, I voted for Brexit, I didn't. Okay, well, I'm going to live in the part of England that is Brexit and you can live in the part that's not. We didn't do that. We're all in the same boat. 
So really, we have to all have our opinions and voices heard and, and work together. We can't say, well, we're in charge for a bit, you don't get to say, and then you can be in charge for a bit and we don't get to say, and then we'll turn. It just isn't. It's silly. It's silly. But that's another story. <laughs> we're talking about suicide, aren't we? Let's get, see, I was so going to bullet point this and then I've just gone right off on a right wanging tangent. Do not ask a question that indicates you want no for an answer. For example, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? That's interesting because, that's my catchphrase, we need to put a t-shirt out with, that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting because, uh, it's interesting though because it's so easy to do, isn't it? You're worried about something, so it's a negative in your mind, and oh, you, you're not doing this, are you? I worry about it. You, you don't want them to say, yes, I am, and then you have to go through this process of this conversation that's difficult and awkward anyway. So you're not. It gives someone the opportunity to just say no. In fact, it leads them into the, the, the easy answer of just saying no. And then where do you go with that? Then where do you go? You have to argue with them. Well, I think you are. Well, I just said I'm not. Great, we're back to the argument. So do not use a no, uh, uh, a closed-ended yes-no uh, question that implies the the no is a better answer than the yes, is a more um, safe or happy answer, That you know, it's a, it's a better answer. Do not try to single-handedly resolve the situation. Yeah, I said that earlier and I really agree with that. When I say bring someone in, of course, two heads are better than one, aren't they? It's, it's not easy for one person to fix everyone's or anyone's problems. So don't try and do it on your own. Try and bring more people in. Because, of course, the more people that are involved in the support of someone, the more chance they've got of receiving enough support to get better. Never say, it's all in your head, or just snap out of it. We looked at that before as well, didn't we? You've got to respect the feelings of the person you're helping. You simply have to respect their feelings. And... We talk about distraction on Mental Health Monday. We talk about if you're having anxieties that you should distract yourself. That comes under snap out of it. It's all in your head. Think about something else. We try and do that consciously ourselves to help ourselves deal with stresses and negative emotions. Fine. But we're not going to say that at crisis point, that is the, you know, a bit of mindfulness now. Forget it. That's not what we're going to say. It's not good enough. It's not enough. Um, I'm going to go on a minor tangent now and have a minor, a minor rant, which was that I read an article while I was researching today's episode about ASMR as a therapy. About an, I think they were an ASMR artist. I haven't seen their work, but they are also a doctor or um, research scientist, and they did a research paper about whether ASMR can be used as a therapy, and it made me angry because I thought today we're doing, you know crisis point suicide imagine someone at crisis point opening up an ASMR video and finding that whilst it's slightly relaxing and you get a few tingles it doesn't actually help your real life problems and you go on to kill yourself you know imagine labeling an ASMR video as some sort of therapy or this will help you sleep or 100% of people will get to sleep from this and you don't you lie, lie awake all night still with the, the the heartache and the insomnia you know what have these people done to help people by labeling this stuff as that no 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 it's 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 nice in the same way as mindfulness is really powerful and really nice but we're talking about the serious on the ground in the moment crisis point you know there are certain things that don't cut the mustard that are just not good enough and that's why we're in this problem this mental health problem crisis in our country in, in a wider sense as well because the things that are offered we'll come to it at the end but the things that are offered are either not good enough not there or a bit <laughs> what am I going to say here um, it goes do you remember that time I told you the story about that woman who wasted all the money on the kids cafe in our in our local town you know it's nice people with, with well meaning intentions but they just don't understand the severity of the problem and they just do not have the capacity to really help where it's needed so they offer these hollow options and quite often quite often there's a num number of people that seem quite nice but are actually personally benefiting out of the, the offer you know why don't you watch the ASMR videos that I make and get me some advertising money 
so you can feel better. And if you feel better, great. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. I've still got my advertising money. Trust me, it's therapy. Like, you know, it makes me cross. But never say it's all in your head. Just snap out of it. Never say that we're going to distract you from this and we're going to feel better that way. That's something we say all the time in Mental Health Monday. That's what the ASMR is for. But at the end of the day, the mindfulness and the meditation is not an emergency measure. You know, it's a, it's something you cultivate to maintain a healthy mental health perspective. But once you're down in this thin end of the wedge, once you're down in this ditch, it's not, you know, it's it's not a, a stepladder out of that slurry. It's it's not a me reaching out a hand for you to hold in the real terms, in the real terms. So um, ASMR can help you. You put it on to distract you from dark thoughts. I, I agree with you there, snippy, snippy steps. It does help you sleep. Yeah, it is good, you know, but uh, it's not some magic quality of ASMR that's making that good. Uh, there are other forms of, um, you know, the thing that it's doing, the distraction is what it's helping. Like, it's not that whispering and tingles fix your brain, is it? And and these wider problems that you are distracting yourself from are not ever going to be faced up to and fixed through distraction by ASMR. And and I even, re you know, there's these other, you got oh, got me on a little mini round, but I'll just finish it. Um, there's this other, like for example. Um, you know, because we're dealing with anxiety and things like that. We're dealing with really trying to fix them. But there's these other, comp you know, therapies that are thrown out there, aren't they? Like um, <laughs> wet flannel therapy. And if you put a wet flannel on your face every day, uh, the magic mystic meridians will make your anxiety go away. And like, you know, ultimately it won't, will it? You know, it's just, a, it might for some people, and some people might like the wet flannel, but we're dealing with a mental health crisis where people are running around at crisis point. And if you put a wet flannel on their face, they're just going to take it off and throw it down and say, look, for, for sake, I'm actually fucking breaking here. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? And the final bullet point that I have to say for the edit is please remember a suicide threat or attempt is a medical emergency requiring professional help as soon as possible. And we will put the medical helps in the edit. Techniques that will de-escalate a crisis. Do we get to that now? Types of treatment. We don't get to that now, I'm afraid. <laughs> we pick up again next week, and which is fine because I've got actually a bit more to do about this urgent stuff. And I wanted to talk about... Um, I wanted to talk about crisis points and who you should call and how to, you know, one-on-one -on -one deal with it. But I also wanted to talk about if it's you that's in the crisis, how to deal with it. We're all humans. We're all in this together. That's the main takeaway from this this episode, I think, is the good thing to take away from it. And uh, I'll tell you another special thing to think about here before we leave is that just as we're doing this now, this little nucleus, this little thing, um, it's happening in society you know, we care about each other. We do. And there are lots of negative things in society. There are lots of things that you're going to see tomorrow that are going to make you feel a bit ugh. There are lots of things that you're going to hear from people that are going to make you feel a bit ugh. But you've also got to remember that we're here and you've got us and we can do this together. And it's growing. into If we're doing this, someone else is doing it out there too. And all we've got to do is keep doing it and keep raising the voice keep waving the flag until you can start to see the other flags over there and you can start to you know if we set up our bonfire you know if we start to make that visible then other people are you'll start to see on the hills far away that there's a, a light burning in the distance you know and if we can start to bring these things into existence in small ways we can start to bring them into existence into bigger ways and eventually we won't be talking about what a difficulty it is to help someone. We'll be talking about what it was like in the past when people needed help. Do you know what I mean? Uh, we can push for something better. And so Mental Health Monday is only one aspect of our stream here. Um, the other aspect is that better, is that other stuff, the stuff we enjoy and the stuff that brings joy to our lives. So uh, I want you to remember that that for me is you. You're bringing joy to my life. Today, doing Mental Health Monday, the, honestly, the joy that I feel from seeing these new names, from seeing these, uh, I don't want to say old names, but um, regular is a better word, isn't it? Regular names, both together is joyful to me. So you're playing a huge part in someone else's joy. So make sure you remember that. And uh, 
you be good, my little podcast. This is my, I always say this, you be good. The battery's going to run out now, so we have to be good. <laughs> you be good, my little podcast. And if you can't be good, if you can't be good, you're naughty. You're naughty. Well, you're not naughty, are you? Look, we did 10,000. Is it 10, 100, 1,000? I, I can't do numbers very well, but that's a lot of tippies. <laughs> the dog's going to get his poo picked up tonight. <laughs> I'll tell you that. It's going to get it put in one of the, the posh bags tonight. Marlo, break out the posh bags. We've had some tippies. <laughs> Daddy doesn't have to put it in his washable sock tonight, does he? <laughs> we can use the disposable bags, Marlo. <laughs> you be good. You be good. You are good. You are good. <laughs>